Hi guys, welcome back aboard good old Athena. In last week's video, we made it to the halfway point in our Atlantic crossing. So that means we got the first 1,000 miles out of the way. In this week's video, you join us about 50 miles from Barbados. My name is Mess, this is my wife, Ava. I've spent the last five years on a somewhat extensive refit of our 1987 Warrior 38 named Athena. That was a DIY fun-packed adventure complete with a very extensive osmosis treatment, building a new rudder using vacuum infusion, rebuilding the entire deck, gutting and subsequently rebuilding most of the interior, painting the top sides and a ton of other projects. The summer of 2021, we started cruising full time. Now we're finally ready to begin our adventure. Like I mentioned, you're joining us about 50 miles from the northern tip of Barbados. We're heading to Port St. Charles, which is gonna be our port of entry. Hopefully there we'll be able to clear immigrations and customs. This is Barbados and we're heading for Port St. Charles, like I mentioned up here. That is supposed to be the best port of entry for smaller vessels. You can also use Bridgetown, which is the big town down south as a port of entry, but we've read some mixed reviews for that and it seems like the northern port of Port St. Charles is a better option. And also up there, I believe there is a fuel dock so we can refuel with diesel. We have room for about 500 liters of diesel here aboard Athena and out of those 500, we've used about 300 on the passage. That is mainly due to the first four, four or five days where there was absolutely no wind. The forecast did promise that the wind was gonna pick up sooner than it did, but it turns out a forecast is not a guarantee. You might have spotted in the beginning of the video that we only have a tiny sliver of sail out. That is because we wanna time our arrival in Port St. Charles with us being there during daylight. Based on what we've read on Navali and also what we can see on Google Maps, the anchorage at Port St. Charles is a combination of sand, stone, and perhaps a little bit of coral. And for the anchor to dig in, we desperately need to hit one of the sandy patches. And yeah, I just don't think we could see those patches during the night, hence the need for us to get there during daylight. We have about 15 knots of wind, and with this following sea and that wind, we would easily be able to do five knots, but that would have us arriving in the middle of the night. So yeah, we've slowed down to a snail's pace of around three knots. The Atlantic crossing has been nothing short of fantastic. We've had pretty good weather. We've had four days where the seas were pretty lumpy and it was a little bit uncomfortable. Other than that, it's been fairly good, although a little bit rolly, just like today. Now we've had internet the entire way across the Atlantic, thanks to Starlink here behind me. In Mandelo, Starlink didn't really work, but as soon as we were about two days out of Cape Verde, the connection stabilized a lot and the speeds were great. But about halfway across the Atlantic, there was a global, I think it was a global Starlink outage because of an expired certificate at one of the ground stations or whatever they're called. And that meant we lost connection here. Of course, we didn't know the reason for us losing internet. So I just rebooted the router, the Starlink, and did a stove at unstow in the app. That is this button right here in the app. I hope you'll be able to see that on camera. But that basically just collapses this year into a more compact state. And um, usually when we then unstove it again when we're underway, if it's calm conditions, then a day or two later, it'll go into kind of like a flat mode. And in that flat mode, it seems like the connection has always been more stable. But as you just saw up there, it's still kind of in the stoved mode. I don't know why that's the case. We did get a firmware update somewhere during the passage here. Maybe that changed something, or maybe it's because the boat is constantly rolling. It doesn't want to go into that unstoved position. But yeah, there's no way for us in the app to force Dishy into that flat mode, sadly, which, I mean, it does make sense because technically we are not allowed to use this dish while we're in motion. Here's a screenshot of the uptime from the Starlink app about two days out of Mandelo. And then this screenshot is from this morning. As you can see, the connection is far less stable right now. To my knowledge, there are only two things we can do to solve this issue long term. We can either upgrade to the in-motion antenna from Starlink, which costs $2,500, or we can hack our current dishy and disable the motors. But yeah, one of those two options I think is on the to-do list for this summer. Other than our dishy acting up a little bit, we haven't really had a lot of stuff break. We've lost our old whisker pole, or we've broken it. Hopefully it's fixable. We've also had the little issue with the top bushing on the rudder stock. 
And then as of this morning, our high output alternator on our engine uh, no longer charges the batteries. So yeah, there is some stuff for me to look into when we get into Barbados. It's been a rather long, very uneventful night, but uh, we're finally at the trailing end of our last night at sea. As you can see here behind me, the sun is just slowly starting to come up. All night we've been able to see the lights of Barbados here behind me. It's been so close, but we've had to hold off until it gets daylight and yeah, now it's only a few hours away. Slowing down worked really well. As you can see, we are four miles away from the northern tip of the island and 12 miles away from our final destination. It was a little bit frustrating to see the lights being that close and not being able to go there. And also it was a fairly rolly night because we were going so slow. There's definitely a, a sweet spot in terms of speed where the boat tends to roll a lot less. And uh, yeah, we're far from that sweet spot this night. But like I said, a few more hours and we'll be able to head in. As we rounded the northern tip of the island, I jumped up on deck to get our whisker pole put away and to remove our preventers. While I was up there, I raised the yellow Q flag, signaling that we've not yet cleared in. As soon as the hook was down, I unfurled the solar panels, giving us a total of 1600 watts rather than just the 800 watts with two panels. Mindelo had left its mark on the solar panels in the form of a thick layer of sand. Fortunately, when I installed the cockpit shower, I got one with a long hose so that we can use that for rinsing off the solar panels. With our energy situation sorted, Ava and I headed to shore to clear in. This is one of the big upsides to coming to Port St. Charles. It is indeed super easy to clear in here. Immigration, Health and Customs are all located in one building and it took us only about 10 minutes to clear all three. We slept for 11 hours last night, no joke, and it was glorious. Now, before I crashed last night, I did have time for a quick swim around the boat, and it looks like we have a bit of growth. So the first thing I want to do this morning is to don ye trusty scuba gear and jump in the water and give the hull a good scraping and a good scrubbing. It just makes a lot of sense to take care of the growth before it gets any worse than it is. Oh, look at that little guy, a sea turtle right next to the boat. That's pretty freaking awesome. We have two almost complete sets of scuba gear. This is Ava over here and this is me over here. I've been scuba diving since I was 15 and Ava's never scuba dived before. So the plan is for me to just scrub the hull and then a little bit later today we'll take Ava into the beach and I can give her a little bit of an introduction to scuba diving. And if that turns out well, if she likes it, well then I think we'll sign her up for an open water certification down in Bridgetown. Yesterday when I was looking at the hull and looking at the growth which it's, it's not a lot of growth but like I said it makes sense to deal with it before it gets any worse than it is but when I was looking at the hull I noticed that there's not a single spot of growth on the wind vane rudder but we do have some on the hull and I think I know why. The copper coat on the wind vane rudder is brand new and I activated that using one of these guys here before we left the canary so that's about two months ago. I haven't scrubbed the rest of the hull or activated the rest of the hull for about nine months so I think this guy is due for a bit of a workout. Before we get to the scrubbing and the scraping there was one important little side quest to retrieve Ava's sunglasses that she'd accidentally lost yesterday. With that out of the way, I got my trusty scraper and set out to do a little miniature genocide. Our little stowaways look very cute, but the free ride is over. The infestation is mainly located around the sail drive and the rudder. The rest of the hull has a little bit of fur growing there, but that's about it. After much scraping followed some scrubbing. While I was in the water, I wanted to check on the anchor. I'd already checked that we weren't damaging any coral when we first dropped the anchor. This time around, I just wanted to see if the anchor had moved. As you can see here, the anchor hasn't moved a single inch and is perfectly set. 
In this anchorage, there are little islands of coral. This is what I wanted to make absolutely sure we weren't damaging with the anchor or the chain. Scrubbing the hull is definitely a little bit of a workout, so I think we'll split that into a two-day adventure. Now, like I mentioned on the passage, there are only a few things that broke. One of them was our old whisker pole. We've got the new one mounted here now, but we can't make this collapse all the way so it sits flush with the mast. That's because this track system is designed to have the pole attached down here. And this is something the previous owner added, a bit of a cruiser's fix. But it did come in very useful because we could attach the new whisker pole to this eye. To be able to mount the new pole, we need to get this bracket thing here off of the old pole. But the opening mechanism here was seized shut, so I couldn't do that while at sea. The only thing that's broken on the old pole is this little plastic tab here that's one on each side. This is what locks the pole in position, and this has just become worn over time. This is what the old one looks like. As you can see, it's kind of worn down versus the new one, which has a nice sharp edge down here to keep the pole from collapsing. I think I might be able to get a new one of those plastic doohickeys and if that's the case then the old pole should be good as new so ideally i would like to not damage the pole while removing the little bracket this is the classic problem of aluminum and stainless the little pin that's inside of here is stainless and all of this is aluminum so it's probably super corroded here inside the old whisker pole says camp on it so it's definitely old and uh, yeah this may or may not be possible to take apart but let's give it a go Nice! We might as well give everything a quick little polish before putting it back together again. See, this looks pretty nasty. We can probably make that a little bit shiny. Thanks to the power of Autosol, this little guy is now looking a lot shinier. Now, all we should have to do is just move this guy to the bracket and then hopefully we'll be able to stow away the whisker pole. Awesome. You might recall that I mentioned earlier in the video that our high output alternator had stopped charging. But when we got in, I checked our logs and it was just a high temperature cutoff for the battery compartment. So that means we need a little bit better ventilation in our battery compartment, but nothing really broke, which means the only thing that were really broken on our passage were the pole, which was an easy fix, and also the rudder top bushing, which was also an easy fix. We're heading into shore because the day we got in, we had these delicious fish sandwiches at this little hut. It's called the Caboose, and we've been dying for one ever since we had the first one. So we're going to go grab one. It's not too far of a dinghy ride. We're anchored right off of Port St. Charles, and the Caboose is like right on the outskirts of the town called Spike Town. So it's just like a five minute dinghy ride. Well, that's five minutes with our slow ass electric outboard, which tops out at about three knots. So yeah, it's gonna take a few minutes. There's this beautiful beach right behind me, and it's really cool because all of the buildings that used to be a resort is closed down and it's pretty much abandoned right now. So the beach is pretty much private. There's like nobody ever there, but it's also a little eerie, a little spooky with all the buildings, but it's cool. Luckily they look open, except we were here the other day, like right before dinner and there was tons of people here. Oh no, it's closed. <laughs> it's only open Wednesday to Sunday. No. That is a bummer. Like it says right here, Wednesday to Sunday. And I was literally staring at that and I, the other day and I thought, oh, that's weird. They're only open Wednesday to Sunday. But this is it, it's so cute. It's like a little old boat. That was kind of a bust. So we are going to head closer into Spike Town to see if we can find something else. I don't know. It's an adventure now. A little recognition from home. This used to be an Ace Hardware, but it doesn't look open anymore. It looks like it's closed. Like I said before, this is Spike Town and our taxi driver said that this used to actually be like a big bustling city, but they actually diverted the highway. It used to go through the town and they diverted it around. So since then it's actually died down a little bit and 
it's not as bumping, but it's perfect. I mean, there's a grocery store, there's a few shops and a couple restaurants, so it's perfect for us. Before we end this video, I just want to take a minute to say how thrilled we are to finally be here in Barbados and how cool it is for us to be able to finally check across an ocean off of the bucket list. Yeah. Our crossing was nothing short of fantastic. We had some absolutely amazing sailing, both under white sail and also with the old spinnaker, which despite what I was told in the Canaries looks very symmetrical to me. Well, they add a new asymmetrical spinnaker to our wish list. There was just the right amount of stuff that broke, meaning almost nothing as you've seen. The next time we're somewhere where we can haul out the boat for a bit of time, I'll take all of the steering apart and start from scratch. On the second half of the crossing, we had a handful of squalls pass our path, but uh, with the exception of one, they were all pretty mild. In terms of highlights on the passage for me, besides the great sailing, there were two. One was the wind vane, which I spent a few days playing with on multiple points of sail, and I was delighted to see that it's actually a lot easier to use than I thought it would be. The other highlight for me was getting hailed over the VHF by a giant tanker by someone that had recognized Athena in the middle of the Atlantic. So uh, a little bit behind on your, your video, um, uh, I think I'll have to watch you in uh, St. Bernard. Yeah, the, the videos are about three or four weeks behind real time right now, so you kind of busted us here. <laughs> One of my highlights, of course, was swimming in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. That was both terrifying and exhilarating. And I also think there's something very cool that maybe there's a chance that we are the only people who have ever swam in that part of the ocean, like in that exact spot. So I thought that was really cool. and. Something else that I really loved was just like the silence and the quiet. I mean, we had a really lucky weather window where we could really enjoy a lot of the passage. And it was just like once we shut the engine up and we had the sails off, it was just so nice like thinking that it's just us out there alone in the wind just shoving our boat and our home to the other side of the world. Yeah, that was pretty freaking awesome. And now we're here. Yep in awesome Barbados. Yep. We'll end this week's video here. Next week we're going to head south about 10 miles. That's how long the island is. It's <laughs> not very big. Yeah. We're going to head down to Bridgetown, which is the biggest town. And uh, we'll see what that has to offer. We're also mm -hmm. going to get a um, tour of the island from a friend we've made here. Yep. And um, Give me some dive lessons. Yeah, we want to see if we can yep. find a dive school for Ava. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, we hope to see all you guys back aboard Athena next week for some uh, fun. Mm -hmm. Tropical fun. Exactly. Oh, ow. <laughs> okay. Yeah, as yep. always, feel free to leave a comment down below and don't forget if you've enjoyed this video, please remember to leave a like. See, See you. you. Cue the drone shot. <laughs>